Thank you so much for joining us for the UCSD Emeriti Association Legacy Project. The purpose of the project is to provide a video and audio archive of UCSD history as provided through individual interviews with retired faculty and other key citizens of the campus. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing distinguished Emeritus Professor of Medicine, Dr. Stephen Howell. Dr. Howell has led an illustrious career in cancer medicine. He was also present during the earliest years of the formation of UCSD Moore's Cancer Center, and I will be asking him to reflect on that period and the people who created the Cancer Center. The John and Rebecca Moore's Cancer Center was founded in 1978 and is San Diego's only National Cancer Institute designated Comprehensive Cancer Center. Its blend of cancer research and patient care continues to transform cancer prevention, detection, and care throughout the region, the state, the United States, and the world. S Steve, thank you so much for sharing your history and perspectives with us today. I'd like to get started by asking you to briefly describe your early life, your family, key turning points in early life and early adulthood that may be related to an inspiration for your career. Well, Barb, it's a pleasure to be uh, interviewed by you today. So I'm a product of New England. Uh, I grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts. My father was a cloud physicist at MIT for a while and then had his own consulting firms. And he loved the outer doors. And I uh, joined that crowd, uh, uh, learning to ski and lots of out other outdoor activities. And he really imbued in me this love for curiosity. How do things work? Um, I went to the Putney School uh, in Vermont for high school, another very outdoor experience um, and uh, transformative in terms of focusing on the things that I have done as uh, for enjoyment out for the whole rest of my career. Um, but after th uh, years in Vermont, I decided I wanted a big city experience. And so I went off to the University of Chicago and left it in a fair hurry four years later to go back to Harvard Medical School. And then uh, internship and residency at the Mass General. Uh, and then I had the pleasure of going down to the National Cancer Institute for, for two years of training. Um, and eventually out to California for a senior residency at the University of California, San Diego. And um, then back to the Dana-Farber Cancer Center for uh, medical oncology training, where I uh, encountered some of the some of the luminaries of the early part of the medical oncology uh, field. Um, I had the opportunity to stay on at Harvard, but I'd been in the Harvard system for a fairly long period of time, and uh, I decided to take the adventure of moving back out to California and uh, joining John Mendelson to start the UCSD Moore's Cancer Center. And so, so uh, yeah. So, Steve, how did you decide to uh, you? Your fellowship was in oncology, medical oncology. Medical oncology was a, a new field at that point. How did you decide on that initially as a training area and then a career development area? You know, at the NIH, I, I, they were training me as an immunologist. But when I got out, I realized that at that stage, there was essentially nothing that you could do for a patient that involved immunology um, other than steroids. And so that took me to the study of early uh, cancer chemotherapeutic agents. And at that stage, the platinum drugs had just come on the scene, uh, were, were not, uh, you know, were very exciting. Uh, novel ways of delivering drugs uh, were, were uh, uh, coming uh, on the scene at the same time. And so I got drawn into the intellectual uh, curiosity of how do drugs work? How does the biology of cancer meet the ability of drugs uh, to kill those, uh, to manipulate that biology and to, and to kill cells? So that's really the source of the curiosity for me. Wonderful, wonderful. I have to let you know, and perhaps I have in the past, that uh, I worked with George Canellis a long time ago in some of the cooperative group clinical trials. And he told me early on that he remembered you from fellowship days. And he they referred to you as Hungry Howl because you always were curious and you wanted to push the envelope and investigate new areas. So I thought that was a very much a, a strong compliment. Well, George had a nickname for everybody uh, in the fellowship program. And we were honored. If you didn't have a nickname, you worried. 
<laughs> right, 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 right. Um, how were you uh, recruited to UCSD? You mentioned John Mendelson. Well, how did that process develop? Because I noted that your faculty appointment at UCSD was the year before the Cancer Center was officially formed in 1978. Right. So this happened uh, through Mark Green, who was a colleague of mine at the Harvard Medical School. And we had sort of lost touch with each other during the internship and residency years. And Mark was back in Boston, uh, and we happened to get together for dinner, just a social affair. And he said, look, we have this new program out in San Diego. Mark had come out the year before. And so he introduced me to John Mendelssohn, and John was really the key. Uh, John was uh, the person who uh, made the difference uh, and fostered the idea that I could really uh, develop a program standing on my own feet, surrounded by an incredible group of of basic scientists and translational scientists, um, clinician scientists, and that's uh, it was very attractive. He had a wonderful magnetic personality when it came to doing those things. Wonderful, great, great. And were there other key faculty in addition to Mark Green uh, that were important in those formative early faculty years? Yeah, it, it was an, a, part of the fascination was literally that you were a clinician, or I was a clinician uh, with a scientific bent, but surrounded by really outstanding basic and translational scientists. Jay Siegmiller in the folate uh, world, um, Herb Wohl uh, was a medical oncologist, Mickey Goulian studying DNA and how DNA worked, and later, um, uh, particularly Bill Lucas, uh, who was the GYN surgeon at the time here, the GYN surgeon at the time, and he and I developed a large uh, ovarian cancer program through intraperitoneal chemotherapy and uh, and related uh, uh, kinds of therapies, and uh, it was that mix of wonderful people, and then recruit you know people like like yourself and Ray Tatel and Maury Markman. Uh, all came on in various stages of the of the cancer and contributed a tremendous amount. Um, and that that combined with the the youth of the field, <laughs> medical oncology was young. Things were changing fast. And uh, if you didn't, you had to buckle your seatbelt to to stay on top of the information. Uh, yes, absolutely. I remember those early years. Um, what was the um, what was patient care like during those early years? We only had Hillcrest Hospital, obviously, because uh, we had acquired it from this from the city, from the state, I guess the city, uh, as a safety net hospital, and it became our only teaching and patient care facility at that point. What what was patient care like then? Basically, you saw everything that came in the door. Um, so I saw breast cancer, renal cancer, GYN cancers, uh, lung cancer. Um, it was uh, pretty much uh, a broad spectrum. It, we, it fairly rapidly um, it, uh, became a little bit more specialized. Uh, um, but Mark and I in particular, um, and John, uh, really uh, saw uh, the bulk of the patients outside of the VA. And um, one did one's best to stay on top of, uh, of the latest thing. In those days, uh, therapy was somewhat simpler. Um, and there were very well-established programs for uh, most of the diseases. Um, and the newer understandings of sub subtypes of cancer, particularly breast cancer, hadn't really been fully formed. Um, the fact that you need to treat some of these subtypes quite differently from others uh, was still in the early stages of its understanding. Um, so one did uh, the best one could, and uh, we were always grateful for the opportunity to recruit somebody who is slightly more specialized, and we, we could begin to specialize as well. Right, right, right. I remember those days when um, uh, conferences, clinical conferences, the HEMOC conference was really phys uh, faculty physicians presenting cases rather than fellows uh, uh, as yes. it is today. Um, and those were very exciting discussions uh, by uh, all the luminaries that you've described, including yourself. Um, so the Cancer Center was formed uh, in 1978. Was it the grant that led to, quotes, the Cancer Center being formed? It was housed in a building and in Hillcrest. Uh, how, what further can you talk about the physical formation of the Cancer Center? Well, it, it, it was the, the awarding of a center grant. 
that established the cancer center. I guess the university had sort of declared the cancer center uh, slightly before that, but it was really the the first cancer center grant that that founded it. And then uh, the Gildred family that uh, stepped up to the need to have uh, specialized clinic space and uh, built the Gilder facility downtown, which had infusion space and, and uh, exam rooms, clinic space uh, for that. Um, that uh, then, of course, we outgrew that uh, fairly quickly. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the uh, advent of, of the Thornton Hospital really brought us into the into the era of really outstanding facilities in which to care for patients, radiology support, laboratory support, um, the, the essentials of modern medical oncology care. Um, how has cancer care changed in the intervening 46 years or so, and what do you predict for the future? You know, this is an extraordinary time to be in the field of medical oncology and, and research uh, related to, to cancer. There are more wonderful tools and wonderful approaches that, uh, that can be taken. And uh, the, the whole wealth of information has exploded at such a rate um, that it's more exciting now than it's ever been. I think I can say that with really great confidence that the excitement in the field um, has just built uh, uh, with the years. You know, cancer diagnosis was a terrible, terrible diagnosis in 1977. Um, now, a lot of a lot of folks are lasting well into their geriatric years. We've converted it to a chronic disease in many cases. We mm -hmm. still have some terribly challenging uh, diseases to to manage. But it has become far more of a intellectual pursuit in really understanding how cancers work um, and uh, building on that understanding to find novel therapeutics of, uh, of multiple types and then uh, more effective ways of, of managing patients and making the whole process of cancer care uh, streamlined and, and much more effective. And so what do you predict for the future? I mean, uh, obviously many people in the public say, well, when are we gonna have a, a cure for cancer? Um, what would you say to that uh, uh, question? First of all, we already have a cure for some kinds of cancer. Um, the other, Many other kinds have been converted to chronic disease. I think it's, uh, if I were had the opportunity to start over, I think it would be even more exciting in a second career in this field. I think things are the, uh, are going to, change much, much more rapidly per uh, information flow per unit time. And uh, the enormous power of big data and AI um, is going to dramatically change who does what in our field, who reads radio, who, who reads radiographs, who reads CAT scans, who actually puts hands on the patient um, and uh, who decides which drugs and which therapies to use. Um, our roles uh, in the patient care paradigm are changing rapidly, not only our information flow. And so uh, I think we can anticipate that it will not slow down um, over the next three decades. Um, do you have specific role models that you looked up to early on? You mentioned some of the faculty that uh, were present when you arrived, but have your role models uh, evolved over the years? You know, I, I started off uh, with an extraordinary uh, group of role models. Uh, Tom Fry uh, at the uh, the Dana Farber, uh, George Canellis had mentioned Emil Fry at the Memorial at uh, uh, MD Anderson. Uh, these were giants in the field, and I had a chance to work with them daily. Um, Tom and and George, uh, particularly day in day out for two for two years, and then with Emil Freireich in a whole series of clinical trials and and ancillary research projects and his his team, um, they really uh, even all these years later stand out as the signposts of my of my career, uh, the people who uh, made me uh, feel like there was something that I could actually do for patients in this field. Great, great, great. 
Um, tell us about your specific research and how it has evolved over the past more than four decades. Um, have there been notable patients who inspired your research? Um, and what do you consider your major contribution to the field? So I, I started uh, here uh, asking questions about high-dose methotrexate, um, the thymidine rescue of high-dose methotrexate, um, and was extraordinarily fortunate in that I got my first uh, NIH grant right, right off the bat um, and got deeply into flow cytometry and, and that work. I think uh, probably the most important part of my career was when we started trying to figure out how how else could we deliver drugs and be more effective with them. And that started with the concept of intraperitoneal chemotherapy for ovarian cancer. And um, for those who don't know, inter when you say intraperitoneal chemotherapy, can you maybe put that in a uh, more lay person? Right. Mo most of the terms. therapies that we use for ovarian cancer are injected intravenously. But ovarian cancer is a disease that spends most of its life inside the peritoneal cavity. So in inside the abdominal cavity. Inside the abdominal cavity. Uh, and it, it does spread outside the abdominal cavity late in the in the course of the disease. But we said, look, if if you know we can probably put much, much higher concentrations of drug right on top of the cancer cells if we put it directly into the abdominal cavity instead of injecting the drug intravenously and asking it to get out of the bloodstream and into these uh, nodules that are growing on the surface of the of the abdominal cavity. And that our work led our work uh, pharma, originally in pharmacokinetics and pharmacology studies, and then phase one trials and phase two, and then even a small phase three trial that we ran here at UCSD. That led to seven nationwide randomized <laughs> clinical trials of intraperitoneal chemotherapy, and uh, opened out uh, a whole series of other uh, opportunities to use different kinds of drugs by that route. And the concept of, of compartmental therapy, that is putting the drug in a defined compartment of the body so that you can take advantage of the very, very high local concentrations and much lower uh, concentrations in the bloodstream where the drugs have access to normal tissues, that has now been applied in many different parts of the body. Um, the, the conceptual work was started with intraperitoneal therapy and has, has been expanding now to other compartments of the body. Um, then, uh, you know, the rest of my uh, career has, has been uh, developing drugs and developing drug delivery systems. So shortly after that, Sunil Kim, who was a fellow in my laboratory, developed the, the Deepafoam technology, which is a lipid foam ball, and we could put drugs inside it. And we uh, uh, took a, you know, we got that patented uh, through the university and put Soterabin in it and uh, developed a company and developed a drug uh, that we took all the way through um, FDA. And I took that all the way through as a one-man show. <laughs> I did the presentation, which, which is almost uh, unique um, uh, and near, nearly impossible. Yeah, um, I did all the presentations uh, at each step along the way. We set up a company to run that. It's still here in San Diego. It's now called Pasira, and it is uh, still uh, producing not deepside anymore, uh, but. Um, it has uh, explored the the use of that technology to put together a lot of put a lot of different drugs, and the one that's being sold now is called Exparel, and uh, it is a local anesthetic which is extensively used for long term local anesthesia, and for knee surgery. The, the orthopods love it; they love to put large amounts of this stuff in the knee joint right after the 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 replacement and uh, have good pain control for for 48 to 72 great. hours or so great so your technology is now being used in standard of care situations yep wonderful and we've wonderful. now you know we we've continued to develop other drug delivery systems um and now uh the, the latest version of this is where you've developed a protein a novel kind of protein therapeutic it's not an antibody that targets stem cells in cancers and uh, this now is going to be encapsulated in a in a new company that we've just established here in San Diego. 
Wonderful, wonderful. Well, we'll get back to that in a moment. I saw from your uh, uh, CV that you have multiple, multiple patents. So is the DEPA-FOAM related technology your most important one, or is there another one that's more important or has had a greater impact? No, I think the the DEPA-FOAM uh, was the, probably the most important one. Uh, but uh, the the patents that are now surrounding this concept of a novel kind of drug delivery system based on using naturally occurring hormones as that are ligands, high affinity ligands for receptors that are important in cancer is probably long-term much more important. And there's a, there's a series of patents now surrounding that concept. For for um, depot formulations that give long term. No, no, these are not depot formulations. These are these are taking a protein uh, itself and uh, designing it differently, uh, attaching a warhead to it that will kill the cell when uh, it it finds a specific kind of cancer cell that we call I a stem see. cell. You know. I see. I see. Wonderful. Well, I look forward to hearing much more about that. Um, was there a patient, a, a notable patient or patients, uh, and again, and no confidentiality is uh, exposure is expected, but were there specific patients who inspired you to go in a different direction? There are always wonderful, wonderful patients. <laughs> I certainly had, had a few when I was an intern and resident on the Bullfinch at the Mass General, uh, struggling to, to keep a, a cancer patient alive there. Uh, and she taught me the earthiness of, of simply uh, understanding uh, that the emotions that go along with cancer and, and how to deal with that. And then just the, the, the really uh, the most satisfying is that I've had a series of patients who we d treated with intraperitoneal chemotherapy with, for ovarian cancer who are still now with us. And this is now 20, 25 years later. And that's a very proud moment. Exactly. I, I, people who are listening to this may not appreciate, but ovarian cancer is not high, has not been highly curable in the past and still may not be as highly curable as many other cancers. And so when you do see these experiences where patients go on for many years and for decades without recurrence, that must be incredibly inspiring and very gratifying. It, it certainly inspires you to think even harder about what to do for the next patient. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Um, are there issues or contributions in public service and professional society activities that you would like to highlight? Well, I I did as we all did in those days. I spent many years on NIH study sections, traveling to Washington, D.C. on a routine basis and racing at the end of the workday out to Dulles to try to catch the last flight to San Diego, only to wind up in Los Angeles because San Diego wouldn't let the airplanes land after 11 o'clock at night. But um, I did I spent many years on NIH study sections and then uh, at ACS, American Cancer Society study sections. And then I spent six years chairing the uh, study section program for the, uh, for the American Cancer Society. Um, and uh, then uh, probably the greatest contribution that I've made to the Cancer Center was uh, the recognition that we were doing a really good job of training uh, people in clinical oncology, but we weren't training people uh, to become uh, developers of the next generation of therapeutics. So I started the Cancer Therapeutics Training Program specifically to train people in cancer drug development I managed to get a T32 grant and renew it twice more uh, over a 15 year period of time and set up a lecture series that is still going on Monday morning, uh, Monday at noon, uh, which specifically deals with helping people understand the process of drug development in our field. And uh, that has been inspiring. Uh, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback across from many people in the Cancer Center. Um, that that has contributed importantly to the other aspects of the training that we provide for our fellows. Yes, I can I can attest to how important that seminar series is. Um, and that was uh, initiated in which year approximately? I can't remember exactly which year, but uh, it was roughly 20 years ago. Okay, wonderful, yeah. wonderful. 
lots of uh, trainees have uh, been through uh, that process and have received fellowships as a part of that. Uh, right. And, and we had eight fellowship slots in that program and still have have slots. Uh, great. Great. Um, tell me a little bit about your mentees. You've had a lot of mentees, the trainees at a variety of different levels. Are there, you mentioned Dr. Sunil Kim, are there other ones that you would like to highlight who have gone on to successful careers in part due to your mentorship? Yeah, uh, two. So one of the privilege of uh, 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 being at UCSD is, and it's because of its depth of science, it attracts people from all around the world. And one of the early people who came was a, uh, a gynecologist uh, named Ishi, uh, Ishinishi, Seiji Ishinishi. And Seiji spent two years in, in my lab. We were doing early stage clinical uh, trials of drug to, new drugs. And um, he then went back and uh, de developed as a, you know, went through an assistant to associate to full professor, then chairman of his department, and eventually chairman of the Gynecologic Society of Japan. And uh, he and I uh, continued to see each other in odd places around the world and communicate all the way uh, through through the, up to this day. Um, so that, that's, an, uh, on the one hand, an example of of uh, the wonder of, of our town and our institution that it attracts people like that who became the future leaders. Um, Peter Naredi, uh, a, a Swede uh, out of Gothenburg, and uh, he came as a surgeon and spent a couple of years in the laboratory um, and uh, then went back and had a similar career. He rose through the ranks and became a chief of medicine in Umeå, way up in the northern part of Sweden. And then uh, chief at uh, chief of gynecology at uh, Gothenburg University, um, and uh, those are satisfying uh, trainees, but also long-term friends and uh, wonderful cultural experiences that that um, that populate uh, or populated my life as a as a as a medical oncologist during those years. Great. Great, great. And there, um, should, there are numerous other graduates of the lab that that have have gone on to a variety of both industrial and non-industrial careers around the country. Great, great. Um, you touched a little bit on your biotech collaborations, and you founded recently founded another company. Uh, is there more you would like to say about lessons learned? What you would like the next generation to know about biotech collaborations or founding companies? Um, which which were your most important collaborations? So, yeah. a little bit of history to this. When I first came to UCSD, if you hadn't purified your own enzyme, you couldn't hold your head high. And then a few years later, it was, well, if you hadn't identified your own gene and cloned it, uh, you really can't walk tall. And then a few years after that, um, it became that you, if you hadn't started your own company, you know, you better get with it. <laughs> because... Uh, UCSD has spawned so many uh, wonderful companies out of the technology of the university. So Deepa Tech was the earliest one that I did. Um, we had started two other companies uh, uh, that did not fare long term um, and, and uh, developed the technology that we started with uh, for a few years and then sold that technology uh, to other companies. Um, and this latest company, Symera Bio, um, is again a startup um, that will be looking for funding. And it's a wonderful uh, interactive experience. I've also served as a consultant in many, for many uh, companies and on boards of various companies. And um, it's an opportunity to see the other challenges the 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 business challenges and the organizational challenges that go into moving a technology from an academic environment, uh, pushing it through the the difficult years of the early funding, and then trying to uh, address uh, the myriad of very very complicated problems that emerge as you try to actually uh, commercialize the technology. In, in any medical field, but my experience has been particularly in the cancer world. It's it's exciting. 
it's always worth doing. Um, one of the things that I tell my fellows that is, is that it's always worth going to another cancer center and seeing how it works <laughs> because the cancer centers work differently. It's also fascinating to go and work within a drug company for a while or consult with a drug company for a while and learn about how it works and how they uh, see the world and uh, imagine steering through the challenges that eventually get them to a successful uh, product. So right. I, I, I would say that it has been an enriching experience uh, as part of uh, the things that I have enjoyed about this career. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, you've received a, a large number of awards and honors. Are there key ones that stand out to you or that were most meaningful? Not particularly. Um, if, you know, um, I'm not somebody who <clears throat> um, who uh, celebrates awards very much. Um, uh, but uh, you know, they're nice to they're nice to have, and I appreciate uh, particularly. Uh, an honoris causa degree from the University of Gothenburg, is, which really was a recognition of teaching um, and uh, teaching skills more than anything else. Um, but uh, much more satisfactory to me is uh, achieving a therapeutic development goal or, um, or seeing a patient uh, really respond under circumstances where there was little hope for them. Right. Those are the meaningful things for me. Great, great, great. Um, we have new leadership at UCSD Moore's Cancer Center now. We've, <clears throat> we've had new leadership periodically over the years. Uh, what do you see for the future of Moore's Cancer Center? You know, it's it, things are getting big around here in a hurry. The whole university is getting big. 46,000 students now. And our cancer center, cancer center is getting big. We're hiring lots and lots of uh, clinicians as our patient volume increases. Um, I, I then, and we continue to have a uh, a large number of people in the engineering fields and in the big data fields and genomics, genetics fields that are going to support our efforts to improve cancer therapy further. So um, I think. Uh, we are going to see changing roles. Um, clinicians are going to have slightly different roles compared to to our colleagues who are the ones who figure out the genomics around around patients. But it's going to be a very uh, interesting time. The opportunity to take a blood test and tell you whether the drug is working or not working without any imaging, without anything else but a blood test. That is extraordinary. And I, you know, we're just starting in, uh, to understand how to use these genomic tools to, to improve therapy and to monitor therapy. But uh, it, it's, it's going to change ever faster. And the, the, the people who are attracted to this kind of dynamic environment are going to be more and more fascinating as time goes on. Great, great. Um, what do you want future generations of physician scientists to know about you in addition to the, uh, the points that you've already made? Are there any points that you would like to add? How do things work? Um, this, um, my wife kids me about, uh, about always wanting to know how something works, whether it's whether a car or an airplane or something. Um, but that level of, of curiosity about how things work has really been important to me. Um, and I would uh, encourage uh, people in, in the field to, uh, to try to, to nurture that, that curiosity in themselves. It leads you down a lot of rabbit holes, but it leads you into some pretty exciting adventures as well, um, whether they're in your profession or outside your profession. It also gives you the opportunity to meet some truly wonderful people and enrich your life through those affiliations as well. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, you've been retired for several years. Uh, what have you been doing since retirement? I'm working full time, your, running my laboratory. Running your lab, right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes, so yes. I'm on the RTAD program where the university uh, decided to rehire me on a year-by-year -year basis. 
Um, I've been able to maintain grants through that whole period of time. Um, and I have a very productive laboratory team right now of, of terrific uh, people. And uh, although I can only pay myself 43% from the grants, uh, I uh, I work 100% or more time um, still uh, just uh, because I like it. I like exercising the skills that I have acquired over the years. And I like the intellectual challenges of dealing with new problems. And I love the camaraderie of a, of a team of people working together comfortably. Um, even if we're working remotely at times, um, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience to uh, have the opportunity to continue to do this. Uh, many people might say it's not really work. It's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a joy. <laughs> it is. <laughs> An avocation rather than a, a job, shall we say. <laughs> This is true. Yes, yes, yes. Um, outside of uh, normal faculty duties, were you active in other campus activities? Not very much. I, I was so uh, consumed with both the clinical affairs that I was involved with and the, uh, and the running research lab and, and trying to stay funded from the NIH um, that I didn't engage terribly actively in the campus life beyond uh, the theater, uh, the wonderful theater the, uh, activities that, that are on this campus. Um, but um, I, I don't, uh, you know, it, there's only so much you can do. Right, exactly. <laughs> and if you're really excited about one part of your life, it's hard to stretch it all the way into major other activities. Exactly, exactly. Anything that I haven't asked that you would like to share with others? Not just just the sense of excitement about our profession. Um, it's a, a you know being a clinician uh, is an extraordinary experience, but it's also an opportunity to uh, to teach and to uh, extend yourself way beyond your own skills uh, through the teaching uh, process. It, it's certainly been a privilege of mine to to have had that experience, and I still love it. Um, and uh, look forward to trying to do as long as I can. So I would encourage other people to to uh, dip into the teaching role um, and don't get so caught up in in uh, you know working out the, the next sequencing technology with a new algorithm that you don't have the opportunity to actually uh, help train the next generation as well. Great. Well, wonderful note to end on. Thank you, Steve, for all your insights and perspectives on your career and on the early years of the Cancer Center. It's uh, It's been a nice journey for me to hear further details uh, beyond those that I had been aware of. Well, thank you for the kind words and for the professional interview. It's deeply <laughs> appreciated.